Mark Cleborn and welcome to my series on Flashbang Wallop. Um, basically what it's looking at is the pose and the lighting of the bride and groom and this is my kind of part two. Uh, we're looking again at a model bride and groom on a different workshop, uh, looking at the images. These are the images straight out of camera as well. There's one or two just towards the end where I'm uh, applying a little bit of finish for you, but I'll kind of talk about that as we go through with it. But the whole point of this film is to kind of interpret what I try and do on a real wedding day. Um, but because we're not under those time constraints, um, I'm able on a workshop to show the kind of the full breadth of what we could achieve in perfect day, per perfect weather and so on with it. Um, however, on a real wedding day, if I can accomplish around about 20 to 25% of that photography, that's really what I'm looking for. So you're never going to be able to achieve what we are doing here in a workshop. Uh, again, as I said, it's a model bride and groom. Um, it's a workshop that involves, first of all, a dull start to the day. Um, so we're kind of having to work with flat light. And then it develops on to the rest of the day where we actually get some sunlight and so on. So uh, kind of we'll get a real mixture and a variety going through it. So was concentrating, as I said, on the bride and groom, not just individually, but together as well. Looking at variety, um, we're doing the first session uh, on a pier. So it's kind of a real modern or an old kind of background, whichever way you want to put it, really. I think it has a real contemporary style of feeling to it because of the kind of the wooden slats and the kind of the peeling paint. It just appeals to me and gives me a bit of a New England kind of styling. And the couple are kind of really looking good, good together. In fact, you would have seen uh, this chap uh, on the last uh, video if you saw part, part one. This is with him with his other bride. But the key point is, is variety. And that's really what we're concentrating on during this film is to make sure that, you know, kind of when we get mind blocked, we can kind of think rapidly back to this film and kind of add a few extra photographs or a few extra techniques into our everyday working technique with it. So as far as the kind of the compositional kind of terms are concerned, um, I will be looking at quite dramatic kind of composition at times. Uh, why? Because I like to bring a little bit of a difference to an edge to the photograph. Uh, again, I'm looking at this image here and not only could it be a double page spread in a wedding album where I could actually inset kind of level other images here, that's as if it's a vertical kind of al album, but if this was a uh, horizontal album as such, this could be one big page by itself with still some insets going through it. Exactly the same here, in fact, really, uh, just allowing that compositional kind of uh, uh, space off towards the side here to allow us to either kind of drop some images down here or kind of running down the side and so on. But the key thing is, all the time, not only am I trying to think about the lighting, the posing, or I like to refer to it as animation, um, I'm also thinking about how are these images then going to be used perhaps in the likes of a wedding album and so on. So let's start with the groom. Uh, again, a good, a good looking chap, happens to be my son, so I would say that of course. Um, but the key thing is here, look at the kind of the difference in each of those images. Four completely different photographs in the same location location and all I've done is move the camera position just a little bit and I've changed the kind of the cropping positions and camera angles as well. So the first thing I always want to do is I usually pose for the full length. Once I've got a few full lengths in the bag um, then I'm going to concentrate on basically three quarters and kind of head and shoulder shots. Why? Because they're the biggest sellers. So why spend all that time with lots and lots of full length images if we already know that the majority of the kind of the sales are going to be based around three, uh, three quarter length and head and shoulders of course. So the kind of the classic shot here, I don't where possible shoot flat to the background. What I mean is this kind of shot here. And the reason that I avoid from shooting flat onto a background at times is because it will look exactly that, flat. It's given me no energy, no three-dimensional, no leading lines and so on. And it doesn't give me, you know, an instant separation. Just by here, by turning my camera angle around towards the side, and you can see the leading lines now coming through from the, uh, the kind of the pier shed itself, gives me an interesting background, this kind of dramatic kind of pull away in composition as well, so it helps to everything. But when you do have kind of a, a textured background like you are here, with kind of lots of shapes and patterns and lines, they themselves can also be good in composition. They can also be graphically good as well. Why? Because they themselves are add, adding to the image and they're not just being a flat background like a brick wall or something like that. So kind of, there's no excuse why not to do it. I just like to avoid doing it most of the time because it's going to be an uninteresting background. But this kind of, kind of goes against the grain, as I said. Then kind of coming in close, uh, closer, not afraid to kind of chop off limbs. One of the other things is that if you're ever looking to montage images onto backgrounds and so 
on. I'll always encourage you, don't try and do it when the feet are in. You've got to kind of get all the camera angles right and so on. So just, just a bit of a tip on that. Um, but as far as here is concerned, it's a nice, simple image. Still big composition out towards the side. Now, that doesn't mean that's all I'm going to shoot. I'm still going to go in there and perhaps crop in, in a vertical shot, just that image. Uh, why? Because I know probably the bride and groom are going to want this image instead of all this space. They won't get it. They won't understand it, I promise you. And that's something that I've got to be aware of and accept. But what it comes down, down to when I'm doing the album designs, if I'm adding that little bit of space in, into them, it gives me more kind of development for the product. In other words, the finished album itself. Plus, images that are small in the frame will often sell a lot bigger in size. So if you just fill in the image like here all the time, if you have that in a 20 inch photograph, that's quite a big head. <laughs> uh, all right, but if he's kind of there in that size here, um, you're going to have a much, much smaller kind of uh, image. So he's not going to overpower the photograph. But as I've done here, I've really gone in close. I've cut through the, fo the forehead. I'm, I'm right in tight. And I'd much prefer to do that kind of variety um, than I would just the basic head and shoulders the whole time. But not forgetting, of course, I still will go through the traditional kind of element with head fully in shot and so on. Why? Because it's not my photographs, it's the bride and grooms, of course, and that's very important, important to me is to make sure that they get what they want. So similar here with the bride, uh, we've got this beautiful kind of full length image first. Shot at the back of the dress, it's usually one of the most attractive parts of the bride. I don't mean there's something wrong with the face, uh, but it just kind of, that's where all the, de the detail, the detail as a rule of thumb is on the back, kind of on the bodice and the front of the bodice here. Be aware that if you're kind of using flowers that you don't kind of hide all this lovely de uh, detail here by kind of sticking the flowers up high, so kind of get them away from the bust. Uh, as well as that kind of when we're working through the back of the, uh, the dress itself, make sure you've got all that de uh, the detail showing. Then kind of the three quarter cropping in here, as I said to you before with just the last images. Uh, again, what we've got here is enough composition, but if I want to as well, I've got a vertical com composition with no work. So I could either step for, uh, forward, or if I wasn't at the maximum length of the zoom lens, I can just actually kind of turn the uh, camera through 90, 90 degrees and just zoom in that extra little bit more to kind of crop off the side. So I've got basically two or three shots within the one. And then, as I said, just with the groom before, getting in nice and tight. Now, when I get nice and tight in towards the image, whether it's a three-quarter length or a head and shoulders, I'm always looking to reflect some of the light from below or from the side to punch back up into the face. Just kind of gives us this lovely fashion milkiness to the skin. And it's a great kind of development than a traditional kind of just allowing the light to kind of fall on the face and not really filling in all the shadows without having to revert to flash. And all the images that we're seeing here, except for a very, very few right at the end, it's all natural light, okay? Because I always shoot natural light before reflector, a reflector before flash, and always flash as the last resort. Why? Because flash will often com complicate things, and you're probably going to get it wrong if you're going to start to use flash for kind of the first few times, trying to allow the flash to overpower the scene instead of really controlling it. So then we start to look at what is in the background and what is in the foreground, of course. And I just don't mean the background itself, but I mean the subjects. And the key point is here, um, just by having the kind of the groom through the glass, it gives me a different kind of variety. And I can quickly move my camera angle by moving just camera position around towards the side or lower or higher to dramatically change the images themselves. Once more, we've almost got a picture within a, pic a picture here. So this is kind of one image. He's completely out of focus here on the side, of course, with all the kind of the muckiness of the glass and so on. But it's still a great kind of fe a feeling with that. But when I shoot through the glass and the glass then becomes out of fo focus, that kind of dirtiness that we see here on the glass then just becomes like a kind of a, a haze. So we can kind of get away with that shot. But just be aware in case there's kind of stickers on glass because they can obviously kind of uh, uh, really kind of stand out from the shot, which can look really bad. And then as far as the kind of the position is concerned, never forget to do that three quarter, the full, uh, the full length, as well as the close up shots to add in that variety for yourself. Now the side by side, probably <laughs> I began here um, at the age of 15 when I was doing my first wedding, uh, didn't know any different really. And then I kind of started to look at books and kind of uh, television at that time and so on. Uh, and you, start, you started to kind of observe how people were being put together and they were being turned to the sides or at least into a, a kind of a three quarter position to each other. And it naturally made them look slim. But it also kind of started to bring a harmony within in the pose. And as a rule of thumb, that's where I begin and that's where I end. But somewhere in the middle, especially when you've got young, funky couples, you've got to kind of try and pull some different kind of imagery out of the bag. 
and uh, kind of this kind of sty uh, style in here, um, just kind of the separation, the simple kind of flowers in hand, the kind of almost non-expression, uh, it just actually brings kind of a little bit of humour to it and, and, and almost like a, a 1920s or a 1930s style of photography. Um, and again, this appeals to me, but it might not appeal to the bride and groom. And so it's this balance, this balancing of the variety of photographs that were during the course of the wedding, of course. And then here, just as you can see, just bringing them together, all of a sudden, the animation, this kind of lovely kind of gifting them together, uh, starts to kind of bring all the posing together. I, I hate that word, po posing, because really, uh, animation is based on a limb bend and so on, and that's really what we're trying to do. But we're trying to make it look like a natural uh, kind of animation as well. A key thing here, she's turned to the side, so she's in full profile position. As a rule of thumb, most brides couldn't get away with that because there might be a little bit of a tummy, it might be a very big tummy, and that's the last thing you want to be doing, of course, is turning them to the side fully. What you want to be able to do is just uh, tur turn them so you can see both shoulder positions and just about both hip, hip positions. And by doing that, you're pretty much in the perfect kind of width of the client, and you're naturally going to be slimming them down because of that slight little turn. And the same would go with a groom. If I've ever got a big groom and a slim, a slim bride, I'll use the bride to hide a bit of the groom. If I've ever got a slim groom and a big bride, I'll use the groom to hide a bit of the bride. If I've ever got a big groom and a big bride, I'll always use the big groom to hide a bit of the big bride. But uh, again, when we're talking um, the kind of the oversized bride, and there's a great film on photo training for you, you should watch that, where it's uh, kind of a real bride and groom in exactly that scenario. Um, and it kind of really shows how I handle them to make sure that it's really complementary to their sizes. Um, but as a rule of thumb, what you never want to do with anybody that is very large is, tur is turn them to a profile position because they'll look like they're, preg uh, they're pregnant or turn them to a three-quarter position, in fact, the kind of the classic position that I'm on about. Uh, why? Because basically they're then going to still look fat or pregnant, of course. Uh, speaking about that, it's a good time for me to demonstrate what I'm on about. Um, basically... <laughs> This is better for a big person straight, uh, straight, straight on or a slight little turn. What you don't want to do is see the belly beginning to break the outline here. Um, with a normal kind of client like these guys are, then you can kind of get away with it. But as a rule of thumb, the two-third position is going to be the best for the groom and the bride. That's the clear one. A profile is going to show more of the belly, and you don't want to be doing that unless they've really got a brilliant figure. Uh, but as I said, if they're as big as me, then really a kind of a, a flat on to, cam to camera position and an overlap or hiding them through things like the edge of a pillar, the kind of a bench or something like that, something to disguise the eye. But let's face, face it, big people like me know we're big, and if you can just make us look that little bit less, I'm a happy bunny. Angles uh, is something that will allow us to get a rapid flow of images without real any extra animation to the couple. Once we've got them into a kind of a, cer a certain position and we've got a certain look going, um, just that kind of camera angle, uh, in other words, the camera position uh, change. And if you think of there the nucleus within the middle of a circle or the middle point, yep, all the camera really needs to do most of the time is move around. If the lighting is very specific in one place, in other words, it looks phenomenal for one direction. You've got 45 degree lighting and so on. Great, that's the time when they're gonna be looking at camera position. When the, light, uh, the lighting is bad, then I never want them to look towards me at all. But it still allows me to work around them to get that variety with very little work as far as I'm, I'm concerned, but will give us a maximum variety in the limited time that we're allowed. So just think about the next time you're doing the kind of the bride and groom shots and you're kind of finishing off your full length, your three quarter length, and then your closer up images, just step two paces to your left come back to the midpoint again, and then step two paces to your right-hand side. And they're guaranteed to give you completely different looking Im images and an extra sale to the wedding, of course. Um, now, we've seen some very tight crops in what I've been showing you. And, and basically, traditionally, um, I've got a nice little kind of crop here. We've got good room above the head. We've got kind of good room towards the side. If I wanted to play safe, I could bring them o over just a little bit. Um, I'm, I'm probably only on about um, this much from here being added onto this side. So in other words, just that little bit of a, a, cam a camera turn. What I don't want to do is put them bullseye straight into the middle of the image because that becomes a very boring style of photograph. Um, but what I'm watching for here is the cropping. Don't crop hands, don't crop arms, don't crop heads for the traditional kind of images. When you start to move in close, uh, closer here, 
be aware of hands, but be more aware of cropping off the top of the head, because that's going to be a killer as far as the bride and groom's concerned. They're probably not going to be looking too much at the limbs, but they will be looking if you've cropped off the top of the head. Then when you start to move in clo uh, closer and closer again, you can start to allow yourself a little bit more of a dramatic crop. But as long as you've got that kind of variety, you're going to be safe. And being safe means we're not being sued by a client uh, kind of compla complaining that you've cropped this off and you've cropped that off and there's no kind of basic Im images and so on. When I talk about feet or lens, what I'm talking about is zooming. And the reason in that, when I'm working, let's say, on a 70 to 200 mil lens, I'm, where possible, trying to always work at the 200 length. Why? Um, because I know that's going to give me a dramatic drop-off in depth of field, uh, especially when I'm using a kind of a fixed ap aperture like f2.8 or f4, the background is suddenly going to kind of drop away. E you know, even a background that is just two or three feet away, the closer I get to it, it's going to kind of drop focus like that. Um, most photographers, though, you'll find, they'll kind of get a little bit la lazy and they'll plant their feet on the ground and start to zoom in and out uh, to kind of just allow themselves that variety. Now, whereas I agree with that to some extent, especially when we're in a position and we've pretty much got it all in the bag and I just want to get a little bit closer in or I want to pull back is more, is more the case, that's when I start to kind of pull back on, on the zoom. Um, so when I'm working with the likes of the 24 to 105, most of the time I'm going to be on the 105 of the, the lens and I'm zooming with, with, with my feet, walking away or walking closer. And if time is not on my side or if the location is not on my side, then of course I start to use the zoom lens to kind of pull back and show a little bit more of the, the kind of the forced field as it were. But remember, every time we pull the lens backwards, we're going to be showing more off to the sides of the image. And I know that sounds really daft to say <laughs> to photographers, I apologise, but... Um, Many don't think about the forced perspective that we appear. So when we're working at the 70 to 200 lens and I've walked kind of 20 feet away from them, basically my restricted view on the sides is a much better quality of photograph than kind of getting the same fill of the frame but using the zoom technique where I'll then be seeing more of the edges going off the side because the difference of the perspective from the lens itself. So try and use your feet instead of just the lens the whole time. Twee or not to twee? That is the question. Um, it's not me. That was Shakespeare, I think. Uh, but basically, um, yeah, you know, you're going to want to pose the bride on the floor. First, first of all, make sure it's dry, make sure it's clean. Carry a cloth around with you or a blanket or black bags, whatever it be, to make sure she's perfect going back down to the recep reception with it. Um, but again, you know, if you sit them down, they're curling their legs under each other and you start to kind of fiddle around with flowers or rings or whatever, it can start to look a little bit kind of twee because it looks just that little bit posed. Just that kind of little animation that goes on here, a camera position change, an angle change as well, can dramatically change what looks like a posed image the one minute into a more animated, a more free kind of fresh uh, image the next with it. Things like, you know, losing the arms here. You can see on this top image, the kind of, it's a bad use of kind of po uh, posing here because the hands have disappeared. It looks like we've got stumps on, on the arms. Just by bringing them around toward the side and getting her to lean forward just a little bit brings that lovely kind of flow, that lovely soft animation in towards the sea scene. And, and, if, and if in doubt, start to crop, uh, crop in, shoot high and then down or shoot low and then up just to change that for variety. As a rule of thumb, with this kind of shot here, I always try and shoot high and down. It's much better to kind of look down than look up somebody's nose and so on. So just think, think about the position, positioning. Nothing wrong with twee, but just be aware of how much twee you're putting into the wedding because too much twee can make a, a wedding look very, very old fashioned, of course. And just before we move away from this kind of background, make sure you always shoot the scene. That's absolutely key. I've seen so many photographers' wedding albums over the year in great locations, but they, at the last minute, through fear or through kind of uh, rushing off to the next location, whatever it would be, they forget to actually show up the whole scene itself. It takes you sec seconds to do it, and it really will just add that extra little bit to the, me the memory of the location. Rem remember, most of the time, bridesmaids haven't been here, the mums and dads haven't been here, the guests haven't been here. So when they're reviewing the photographs, you know, in a couple of weeks or a couple of months' time, then it kind of, it's, oh, you were there. That's that kind of asso association again. Now, I've used the word animation quite a lot, um, and this is kind of a good example of just a little bit of a flow, kind of how we're interacting. Now, this couple know each other quite well, so they're kind of not worried about getting close to each other. If you caught the other Flashbang Wallop uh, film, they were uh, met for the very first time on that day with no interaction, and they kind of got on great. 
And uh, again, on a real wedding day, it's easier to get expressions out of a real couple than it is out of a, a model bride and groom, I promise you, okay? As long as you're saying the right things, of course. But as far as the animation here, you, you can see here, I quite like this, in fact, this image where she's just a little bit away from him. It's, it's, it's almost what kind of a cheekiness. She's a strong woman and she knows what she wants. It's, she's going, no, 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 no. I'm still who I am. I'm a strong. You, you just don't get the use of me for the, re the rest of your life. And then it's kind of here. It's that lovely kind of, oh, go on then. And it's this lovely sto storytelling, this lovely little development that you can actually do as a photographer to kind of allow this animation to start to kind of flow towards each other. And then just kind of moving on to the next shot, look now how we start to have a lot more kind of te a tenderness to each other. We've moved away from the, che uh, the cheeky kind of uh, expressions that we've got going on here. We've moved down into the kid a little bit more relaxed, a little bit more romantic images as well. And then of course, at the same time, just kind of coming back. And the likes of a bench or a seat is perfect when you're trying to add a little bit of variety into your kind of photography. Just make sure again, it's clean and it's safe. Those are the two key things for me the whole, uh, the whole time. I don't mind losing a groom on the wedding day, but I'll never lose a bride kind of thing. So make sure, again, as I said, it's perfectly safe. That's one of the great things when I wear a jacket on, on a wedding, if I'm in doubt or I've left uh, a kind of um, a bag in the car or a, a a blanket in the car, I can always use, use my jacket for her to sit, to sit on, of course, and things really. But I don't like the dry cleaning bills, that's why I invest into a blanket. Um, again, just then pulling out will kind of start to add to that scene. Then we move the angles around and then you can get in and add in that extra kind of variety as well. Just a kind of a quick swap here of the groom from the one side to another to allow more of the light to kind of spill onto her. Um, it will just give us that extra kind of variety once more with it. But kind of we're going from against the light to kind of with, with the light. And you should be able to see the slight difference here in contrast as well. Um, why? Because basically the light is coming in from just off behind here at a kind of a, a one, three, five degree position from, cam uh, from cam camera. Um, and when I'm kind of move myself around to where the light is, we've got this flat kind of lighting going on here. And it works with this kind of couple because they're not very big. With a big couple, of course, we really do want to use that kind of ang angle of light to kind of help to slip, slim them down with a little bit of contrast and a little bit of shadow within the scene. Uh, but again, when she's looking towards me here, of course, she's working herself away from the light. So there's a different exposure on the face back towards ca uh, camera than there is here. Um, and that means we kind of get a little bit kind of a mushier light because there's not that full quality, the full intent intensity and the full specularity of the light. So I always try to make up a story and it's kind of having a little bit of a flow and I don't tell the couple the story as such, that would be a bit stu stupid, um, but kind of in, in my head, it's kind of, well, what's going on here? They've had a row. He's a bit upset, then he's kind of making up with it, and then it's kind of, I've got control. So it's that kind of little thing in your head. And this isn't post the wedding, this is actually on, on the day. We're kind of just uh, kind of running through some scenarios as a bit of fun. Uh, and again, probably a lot of couples aren't gonna wanna look like they're kind of really upset with each other, like you can see in a few of these photographs. But as far as a kind of photographer, and as far as a kind of a balance in my albums and so on, it gives that nice kind of depth and breadth to it. The walking and talking, uh, I talk about this quite a lot in workshops in fact, um, because so many photographers, um, they kind of get a shot and then they kind of forget about the interaction between the couple or the photographer is too busy looking on the back of the, ca of the camera or too busy picking up his bag with missing all the other shots in fact really. And what you can just about see here in the, back, the background is one of the people on the workshop. And the reason I'm pointing them out, um, obviously if it was a, a just somebody on, on the pier, I touched that out for the wedding, al uh, the wedding album itself. But um, they're all gossiping in the background, all the people on the, wor the workshop. It's not even a real wedding day, and I'm running to catch the frontal shot as well. So I've got the walking away, the, go you know, the talk and the walk, as it were, trying to get them to look towards each other. Then I'm running right up towards the front to kind of get this natural animation as they're coming through. And then somewhere on the scene, I'll stop, I'll stop them. Hang on, guys, turn, uh, turn towards each other little bit of a cuddle, and I've got another variety of photographs as well. And then probably on the way back to the car, there's gonna be little locations that I might wanna photograph at, and they're not photographs perhaps really that I think the bride and groom will love, but they're photographs that I wanna take. And that's kind of my excuse. I'm not gonna to spend too much time, time here because the broken window panes and the flaking paints doesn't look very good for them perhaps, but I like that kind of character within my photographs. 
Now, in this next series of images, we've come underneath the pier. Now, the great thing about coming underneath the pier, on a wet wedding day, your fingers crossed you're going to be main, uh, mainly dry. That is, as long as the uh, tide's not in, of course, then you've got very wet feet. Um, but what the other thing it's going to do, it's going to subtract some light. And what we haven't seen in the other photographs up until now is a real control and a direction to the light because we are using that natural light direction, which basically was behind them um, or coming from above. Okay, that was the key thing the whole, uh, the whole time. But now we've got a great direction. They almost look like they're flash lit because of this control of the light. We've got light coming through the pillars. And now a pillar is a great subtractor of light by itself in its vertical sense. You have two pillars and they're spaced apart and you have an aperture of light. And that aperture between the two pillars acts like a softbox or acts like a light source. So instantly you get a great direction to the light, the light itself. If you're lucky, like we are here in this, in this pillar, and I can go here any time of day, as long as the sun is out in some way or cloud, obviously at night time there's no light, um, but the light will come back through as well and give me this extra edge light, this separation light, which is just absolutely phenomenal. And whenever I go here with a, a workshop, um, I always kind of just finish off here just before we go for lunch. And the reason being is that photographers cannot believe that when you find the right location, and you use the location to its maximum as far as using the light is concerned, you can get studio quality of lighting without any work and you can rattle off a huge amount of photographs uh, and really add into a different kind of type and style of photograph yourself as well with it. So as I said, there's nothing going on here. There's no reflectors. All it is is light coming through between two pillars. The um, light coming in from behind is given the separation as well around each of them and it just allows me to get that great variety because I've subtracted the light enough from above, I've taken them in towards the, uh, the inside of the pillars more to allow the feather of the light instead of the strong harshness of the light to get this creative image that just brings in a brilliant selection of photographs. So the power of zoom, again, uh, this is where I mentioned before about kind of zo uh, zooming back and this is a quick cheat. You can pretty much see from the perspective of this image that it looks like it's a zoom back image. It gives you that extra width and so on. If I was using um, my feet to zoom, in other words, I was at the long length of the lens, 7200 lens, um, basically what we'd have here is the compression. And we basically kind of have to move cam uh, the camera position because there's no way he would be in the photograph. But just by allowing myself to use that wider ang angle, it starts to give me more detail in the background. Um, so it really allows me to bring a secondary interest through, of course. And then, of course, the power of the zoom allows us to qu uh, quickly add that variety in, just using the, comp the composition once more to give us that three-dimensional kind of draw, this kind of real pull of the photograph in. As the focus goes away, as we can see on the right-hand side behind the bride here, um, it kind of really adds that separation. So the two in the one basically mean it's trying to combine both of the elements, the bride and the groom within the photograph, being able to, seg to segregate them at exactly the same time though, and get those kind of extra images without a lot of work. So whilst the groom is gonna walk in towards me, I can basically turn her around, lean her on the pillar, get her to look off towards the side, and Easter on his way to me, and I've got a photograph done in the bag. Then, of course, I can pull him in towards the front of me here. He's going to lean on this, on this pillar. We're only one pillar apart from each other. And again, with that lovely depth of field, the long lens as well, really drops the kind of the, fo the focus out. Then I'm going to move the bride out of shot. And then basically, I've just got the shot of the groom, that lovely variety. Don't forget the grooms. <laughs> so many photographers forget the grooms. I've got two sons, and when they get married, I promise you, they're more import important to me than their fiancés or wives on the day. Um, don't forget the grooms because the, pa the parents want to buy them as much as the brides do, I promise you. Now, I did talk about that all the other images that we've seen up until now are basically straight out of camera. These two images here have just had a little bit of post-production finishing in the raw to give me this soft kind of glow as well as some retouching on the face. Check out the uh, film on the uh, Training with a Twist um, film here um, where we kind of go through some of the finishing just to kind of give us that variety. So this is just kind of knocking down the clarity in the raw file to give us the, soft, uh, the softness. But just before then, I've kind of done some retouching just around the face to make sure it's perfect at the raw stage so I don't have to touch Photoshop with it. Um, but here, this is the extreme split, the stream out of focus element. And I think this, because of the blue background, that bit of pink on the side, really adds a, a, a kind of a a great kind of modernization to a 60s styling of image. It just brings it alive and great color and usage. 
So remember to also look at the backgrounds. You can find little kind of pots of color or interesting backgrounds that do not suit themselves at all in any other way except for kind of a closer up image and a really kind of zoom, a zoomed in shot. And kind of this huge solid blue color really adds into this kind of overall finish of the photograph and something that I, I love to shoot. This is just a graffiti wall. Uh, it's a great place to actually go and stop at. Uh, another kind of choice of the background, again, ro roller shutter doors are literally on the opposite side of the lane. Um, here, though, we're using just a little bit of ring flash. Now, flash for the very first, first time. This is without flash, uh, but then we're adding a ring flash. So it's an attachment that goes on the front of the speed light itself, goes around the lens, and it just gives me this fashion style of, light, of lighting. I'd only use it on the, this kind of type of couple, the young, the kind of the fit and the slim, um, because if you use it on somebody big like, like me, I just look bigger, okay? And that's not a good thing, I promise you. Um, so the ring flash here just is a lovely, simple kind of development of on camera camera flash. Uh, doors, I absolutely love doors. As I said, the kind of the corrugated door that we got here, but next to this door is another door. And next to that obviously is a surround. And it's literally here. It's just off to the side. And just adding that kind of variety. Now, this isn't everybody's taste. And that's what I was saying you right at the beginning of this film, is that what we're trying to achieve during this kind of film variety on Flashbang Wallop is to show you that in the perfect world, this is the kind of variety that we could end up with. But in the real world of a wedding, we can only take 25%, if we're lucky, of those techniques and apply them into a real wedding day. But if we've trained for those techniques, all of those techniques, it means that we can call on them at any stage and we know we're gonna guarantee and we're gonna get a great image. So as far as kind of the choosing of the, back, the backgrounds, don't run away from doors. Some people say I have a door fetish, in fact, but I promise you it's not. We're back to doors again, <laughs> uh, but this time it's right at the end. We're keeping on the flash theme, um, but now we're adding just a little bit of flash off camera. Um, this is just on a cable, so it's coming off from the hot shoe. It's connected into the camera uh, kind of hot point itself, and this is just zoomed in. So in other words, um, I'm taking any wide angleness of the flash off, and I'm concentrating the light in. And most modern speed lights today will allow you to zoom the flash to the likes of 105, so it's kind of going into a telephoto mode instead of a wide angle mode. And that's exactly what that's doing here. It's concentrating all that light into the center of the image itself, allowing the darkness here to really kind of vig vignette. And the benefit here is that even though I could take the shot here and I could do a little bit of Photoshop kind of trickery to kind of boost the contrast, make it a little bit clear, cleaner, probably be better in black and white where I can boost, boost up the white of the faces more and so on. Um, but really what this is, this is muddy. So this is the wrong time of day at that location. And one of the biggest problems with that, how often have we seen these amazing locations with it? And every time you go to use it, the sun's not out, it's in the wrong location, whatever it is. But if you've got these extra skills and you think, okay, I know I can go there on the way to the reception, which is next door. I can get five minutes there and I've got a dramatic change in the images. So in fact, the flash here is just being used in, T in TTL. So there's no kind of technology from me to it, except for a cable, allowing it to come away from camera position. And this just allows me then to kind of put the light off towards the side instead of heavy shadows. And then to have the full control of off camera flash, it needs to come away from a cable and we need to overpower the ambient itself. Here I'm using a radio tri a trigger. More often than not, it's gonna be the Pocket Wizards, a TTL version as well, um, to just to take the flash away from it. Um, even though I'm using the TTL option some of the time on the Pocket Wizard, uh, in fact, most of the time, I'm using it in a manual mode. And the reason I do that is I like the hot shoe connection to it, so I know it's kind of receiving the information. But in times of need, when I'm in a rush, of course, I opt for the, T the TTL. But I'm often, in fact, in TTL mode, fiddling around with the flash more, trying to bring down power or increase power, than I am knowing how much power comes out of the flash in manual mode. So two different techniques that you need to go and weigh and practice. But basically, by choo uh, choosing a low camera angle here, I've got this kind of silhouettes of the, bal of the balcony with a kind of dramatic museum in the background, big blue skies and fluffy white clouds. Um, but the flash is off towards the side, and I need to at least... Uh, give the exposure for the bride, which is gonna be one stop more than the ambient light itself. So in other words, if the scene was 200 at 5.6, 
I would need to give her an exposure of 200 at f8, so one full stop to allow the, the kind of the skies to, dar to darken down as well as the rest of the scene. And that's it. I hope you enjoyed that flashbang wallet part two, where we were looking at the bride and groom posing and some of the lighting as well with it. Again, as I said, don't try and do it all. Just try and do a little bit. If you can just take one idea from this and apply it into the next wedding, then another idea on your next wedding, you'll soon find that within a very short time, you've added in such a, a repertoire, a new repertoire of imagery and animation to the bride and grooms that your photography is going to completely change itself. But don't try and do it overnight. If you try and do too much, you'll more often than not fail, and it's better to bring one thing at a time. So I'm Mark Cleborn. I hope you've enjoyed it. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>